It's good to be among you once again. If you would please open up your Bibles to John chapter 13. That's where we're going to be giving our message from this afternoon. John chapter 13. It is a blessing that we have another opportunity to gather once again together to be with one another. I hope that we can always see that as such a, a blessing and, and meditate and that we look forward to being able to assemble with one another. And I hope that so far as, as we have done uh, from this morning that we've had uh, the opportunity to gather in, in Bible study and also sing songs like we just sung and had the opportunity already to reflect on the death, burial, resurrection of our Lord. I pray that we never tire of having those opportunities to participate in and as we gather to fellowship with one another. That is such a very important part and it goes well to what we're going to be talking about uh, this afternoon. As I mentioned in my morning lesson I handed at, I really encourage people to hopefully, if you don't have a, uh, a writing utensil, whether it be a pen, pencil, highlighter, bring one with you uh, to services, mark up those Bibles. I know when I was younger I got really sort of on edge of like I'm not supposed to mark in the Bible, it was somehow sacred in that response, but over time and, I, and as I have grown in my understanding. It is so much important for me to make notes when something just sticks out. And this lesson will be no different as to where there will be things that I'll emphasize because I know it's made an impression upon me and, and certain words or certain scriptures. So I encourage, if you don't already mark up your Bible with making notes on, on a particular passage, a word, so it can help in our walks. And when we have conversations with people, I just encourage you to make that available of, of to you as a tool and a resource. We focus this morning on watching out for one another because that is one of our real commands to do. And I mentioned that because as I stated from this morning message, this message will also correspond with our, or I should say with your all, because we too at Tesla Road have a uh, yearly theme, but your all's theme is Stronger Together. When we study scripture and listen to messages, I believe generally we do a good job at focusing in our, what I call a vertical relationship, the relationship between ourselves and God. And that's very important. It's essential. And we must give attention to this most critical relationship because it is our primary relationship that we are to have. The vertical relationship is essential. But the question that I pose this afternoon, what about our horizontal relationship? Our relationship between one another between fellow brothers and sisters in Christ because it is just as important. I would say they go hand in hand. You can't really have a vertical relationship if you're not having a relationship with your, if you're not having a relationship with your brothers and sisters in Christ. You, 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 you have to have both. That's why that this message this afternoon is entitled walking hand in hand with one another. And no greater or appropriate text that is central to this actual lesson than what was previously read by our brother in John 13, in verses 34 and 35. This has a special connection to me because I get the privilege of seeing this multiple times during the week. We have it painted on our wall at the building. At least John 13, 35. 
And we also have it in our weekly bulletins. So I'm constantly reminded of this, this verse. But in case if we have forgotten, I just want to refresh our memories. Jesus is, in this moment, speaking to his disciples. And it was on that final night, just prior to his betrayal and being arrested. And here are some of his last words prior to his arrest. He said in John 13, and verse 34, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, even as I loved you, that you also love one another. Verse 35, by this all will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Before we really dive into these verses, let's first consider the context of what is going on. Jesus is with his disciples, and it is his last meal prior to his crucifixion. And verse 1 of uh, chapter 13 tells us his hour has arrived. Time for his death and glorification is now imminent. And once the meal is concluded, the Lord does something completely unexpected. No one would ever imagine what took place actually took place. And I can imagine the disciples probably thinking about, is this really happening? I can only imagine that probably may be some of my thoughts, or I wouldn't maybe have any thoughts at all, because I'd be just so dumbfounded of what I'm witnessing. But it was something that no religious leader or teacher Certainly you couldn't imagine the Pharisees or any of the religious elite doing what Jesus did. Or anyone for that matter. They weren't forced to actually do what Jesus did. But he did it anyway. He stooped down to wash a person's feet. And much, much can be said, lessons can be preached on and happy to preach on just in this simple act of service. I, I should say simple, but this humble act of service. And we can see the very picture of what, in just this one act, of what Jesus ultimately did for all of humanity. It's a great illustration of his humble act of service. And you can envision him getting up from his seat of privilege, his most privileged position of being the master and stooping down, emptying himself to serve man in the most humble of manner. Verses 10 and 11 really stick out to me because it just shows that Jesus came to serve everyone. And even those who would be his enemies. He came to serve those who would claim to follow him. Certainly those that, quote unquote, claim to be followers but are truly not. And even those that just outright refuse to acknowledge who he is. But here the Lord was demonstrating an act of love towards all. Of course, even Judas, who would ultimately betray him. The Lord then tells his disciples, in verses 14 through 17, that you have seen me what I have done for you. You've just witnessed what I've just done for you. I want you to follow my example and serve others in like manner. Do what I have, do what I have done to you, to others. Follow my example. Serve others just as I have served. Humble yourselves. Don't see a humble act 
an act of serving as beneath you. Make sure that you see the point of serving others as an act of love. Now you can imagine for a period of three years that the disciples had spent at the time of their master. They had witnessed their rabbi act in a variety of ways as being the model that they were to act in their lives how they were to portray themselves. I mean, Jesus had shown the disciples never to overlook the least of these. You think about some of these people that Jesus and, uh, witnessed to and showed his love for, and that the disciples witnessed. You think of uh, the, the Gentiles. You think of women, children, lepers, the lame, and just numerous others. So many times, people, you can imagine, just passing these people by, not giving them a second thought, but Jesus would take time and minister them to them. And he was showing that his disciples, this is what you need to do as well. Act like what I've shown you during this period of three years. What Jesus had done and what he would now tell them really indicates and proves without a shadow of a doubt who a true disciple of Jesus is. Who is truly a servant. I want us to keep in mind, because this is very significant. I mean, in verse 30, by that time, Judas is gone. He, he has left. He has made the decision to go and turn Jesus over. And so it was now only Jesus and the 11. And what Jesus has to say in the following chapters is directed toward his true disciples. And I think that's very important for us to consider. We return to our key text, verses 34 and 35. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, even as I loved you, that you also love one another. By this all will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Just as Jesus is sta uh, stating what he is just saying in this moment, I can only imagine what must have gone through the disciples' minds. Naturally, they would try to be probably getting over, uh, getting over their sense of shock of what just transpired of what Jesus had done for them. But now they are being told a new commandment. I'm sure that raised some eyebrows perked some ears, had some thought of, what in the world are you talking about, Lord? I mean, what do you mean by this? What, what new commandment? What are you getting at? Jesus tells them to have love for one another. But here is the difference from what they would already know from the law of Moses. The Lord tells them to, high, to have a higher standard of love. That is what he's introducing here. Love as I, your master, is telling you is how you are to love. To love as I have loved you. The law as the disciples would have known and were familiar with it's to love your, the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And to love your neighbor as yourself. But what the Lord Jesus is doing here is taking this love a step further. You are to demonstrate love in the way that he has shown. I mean, this is God in the flesh commanding them. And that's why he's able to do this and say that a new commandment I'm able to give to you. Because this is coming straight from God's mouth. 
And that should blow us away. I don't think the disciples quite got that. But remember what the Lord had just done as an example. He had performed an act of humble service even to his betrayer. I mean, we didn't read this one section, but you think about just prior to Judas leaving their company, Jesus offered him a piece of bread. And you might be familiar with this. In that culture, that was quite significant. What Jesus did when he was offering Judas that piece of bread was a symbol of he was extending friendship. He was offering that to even to his betrayer. And obviously Judas rejected his friendship. But we can see how symbolic and rather ironic this action taken by Jesus. But like our Lord and Master, be willing to serve. And love even those that would be our enemies. And that sounds like a radical idea. I mean, that was radical then, and certainly is radical now. From the worldly standpoint, what Jesus did and has commanded his followers to do is in stark contrast to what is what most people would consider normal. But we're to be different. We are to love like our Lord loved. Verse 35, Jesus tells his disciples that their love for one another, as Christ loved them, it would be unmistakable, undeniable. Verse 35 reads, by this, pay real close attention. I think you've already kind of got the hint of a certain word that I've emphasized. But after this, by this, look at that word that comes next. What does it say? And what I emphasized, all. Does Jesus say Love only the disciples or in this passage? A few, some people? No, the Lord declares all that everyone will recognize that they were followers of Jesus by the way that they have loved for one another. So how did we go about demonstrating and determining this type of love? I mean, what does it really look like? Is that something that we need to know and show? And this kind of love is a selfless, sacrificial love. Before we even begin to think that this command and example by Jesus was directed simply, uh, directed simply only to his 11 disciples, that this was only written for them, we should remember what also is written by John in his first epistle. In 1 John 3, beginning in verse 16, the Apostle John wrote there, By this we know love, because he laid down his life for us, and we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. We are to walk hand in hand with one another, then our lives must demonstrate a selfless, sacrificial love. You think about 
the church at its infancy, right at the, out of the gate, so to speak, it had this selfless, sacrificial love, right from the very beginning. In Acts two, uh, chapter 2, and verses 44 and 45, Now all who believed were together and had all things in common, and sold their possession and goods and divided them among all, as anyone had need. And what was just read in Acts chapter 2 and in what Jesus was conveying on that last night is that we're part of a community. You're part of something greater than yourself. And we share a common unity and a common love. And a key component of our community is that it is not hidden. But rather it shines brightly for other ones to see. We are to shine the love of Christ so that the world will see that. Jesus has commanded us to love one another. We know that it is clearly written. It's written over and over. Again, we go back to the question is, how do we go about practicing this unique kind of love? Again, the world thinks it's radical. It's certainly different. It's unique. It is without question a love that is supposed to go beyond these walls. It's not something that is reserved for when we assemble, when we come together on a Sunday or on a Wednesday. When we come together, our love for one another must be manifested. I mean, it certainly has to be displayed when we are together. That should be also undeniable. We should be smiling at one another when we walk through the doors and see one another and be in each other's presence. I'm pretty sure that most of us are familiar with the common passage reference in Hebrews 10, verses 24 and 25. I'm sure that most of you may know it by heart, but I share it again. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together, as in the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. You might ask yourself, well, what do these passages really tell us? I know most of the time we're focusing on not forsaken the assembly, but they remind us of how important us for us to be here. We should never take that for granted. I mean, each time that we have the ability to walk through those doors, we should see it as a gift, as a blessing. Because as we gather, part of the task and part of the way that we show love is to encourage one another in our walk. This passage commands us to provoke one another, stir one another up in order to do good works. That is part of our unique and radical love that is supposed to be demonstrated to the world. If you think about it, if you are not here, then you don't have that opportunity to be stirred up. You don't have that opportunity to stir others up. You don't have that opportunity to consider one another. Frequently, 
we just simply stress the importance of being at assemblies, being at Bible studies. I don't want to dismiss the importance of that because it's crucial. I mean, that's part of our personal growth. But again, I want us to think beyond that in a bigger sense. It is that point of considering one another. It's thinking about this is bigger than yourself. Goes back to that community idea. It's not about you. It's about something bigger. When we fail to attend, then we are failing ourselves and we're failing our brethren. And part of our task as brethren is the ability to stir one another up in our walk. Because the world can knock us off if we're not continually stirred up and provoked continually into love and good works. It's all about remaining on that narrow path. And how can we do that if we do not get together and build up our relationships? It is simply not possible. We have to be connected. We need to remember that this is a foreshadow of heaven. I mean, we should always have that desire to be with one another, to be joyful, to see one another, and not dreading attending because, well, I have to. Let me ask you a couple questions for you to meditate on, because I know I need to meditate on these things constantly. But while we are here, do we feel like we truly engage with one another? Do we truly connect? I mean, I think that from the little what I've been able to see, I think that you all do a pretty good job. But do you feel like there's always room for growth? Is there always areas to improve upon? I know I can. And let me just give you an example. Because I know I have to step on my own feet on this one. And some of your toes may hurt as well. For instance, you probably have an area when you come into the building that you go right to and you, it's like this is where I sit on a given Sunday and a given Wednesday. I always sit right here. This is my spot. No one else can have this spot. I've claimed it. It is mine. I have earned my plaque. What if, I know it's again, radical thinking out, out here, this is way outside of the box. What if we decided a Sunday or Wednesday to switch it up and sit somewhere else? I know, radical idea. But would that possibly give you an opportunity to engage with other people that you would not normally engage with? And possibly build other relationships that you may not have that opportunity. What about this? This might be even sound even crazier. How about sitting closer to one another? You think about this. The church is God's family. And what, what does family entail? It invites closeness. It invites intimacy. If you're part of God's family, I mean, that's all about closeness and intimacy. 
Let's not be afraid of sitting close to one another. Remember, we're not just thinking about growing ourselves spiritually for our own benefit. We're thinking about others. Just think about the people that come in off the street, visitors. We don't know what their beliefs are most of the time. We don't know where they're at in their walk. We don't know if they're believers. Think about what impression we are making upon them. How they will perceive. Like how we sit. If there is space between us. Again, I know I have to step on my own toes. Because this is something I need to continue to think about and meditate on. But what are people seeing when they see me? We need to make it clear. It's because it's undeniable that we are followers, that we are disciples of Jesus Christ. Our love for one another Obviously, it cannot be, as I mentioned, confined to just within these walls on the very few hours that we assemble on a given week. Because there is so much time where we're out there. And how are we making it clear to the world that we are part of the body of Christ? I'll give you an example. Um, not too long ago, uh, one of the sisters lives in an apartment complex, and they have like a little place where, I'm guessing they have to, to rent it, but um, it's where you can meet. And this time we had the ability to have a meal and a sing. Uh, it was just beautiful day and um, but you just think about what's the most beautiful aspect of it is people coming together that wear the name of Christ and singing his praises and not only that but gathering together and building that upon that community building those relationships Developing that true intimacy between one another. I mean, I can only imagine that God smiles at that type of thing. Just being out and about in the community together, that is so key. Considering this further, remember what the Lord said to his disciples, and again, remember, extension to us. By this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Again, I, again, I emphasize over and over again this word, all. Because when we were out in the world, we need to make this love evident. It needs to be purposeful in our discipleship. And I'm, I know that you can, and I would encourage you, come up with a list of opportunities where you can demonstrate this love and make it evident among your community. I thought of some, uh, for instance, grabbing a cup of coffee with a fellow brother or sister. Maybe gathering somewhere where you can have a Bible study. Maybe it is at that same coffee establishment. That's probably, I mean, especially being in Louisville, I mean, we're in, we have no shortage of coffee places. I don't know how it is around here, but it's like one around every corner, it seems. And it's a great place to sit down and engage with a fellow brother and sister and catch up and 
in their life and also engage in a Bible study. And what might be an outgrowth of that? Someone may see, hey, you're studying the Bible. What are you studying? Hey, are, are you a Christian? Uh, what's that all about? It can lead to other things. Maybe you go out for a meal. I went out for a meal this afternoon. I uh, went with uh, Brother Greg, and I couldn't help but overhearing in a table next to us, this uh, one individual was talking a lot about scripture. And we engaged, Greg and I, a little bit about scripture. And at the end of when they got up to leave, this one fellow came over and just said hello. I mean, we wouldn't agree on doctrinal things, but still, just that interaction between two individuals, having a conversation, talking about the Bible, we didn't have our Bibles out, but talking about spiritual things, you never know what that, what's going to lead. You never know what potential invitations or interactions that will occur. How about when you go visit someone that's in the hospital? I know sometimes you have to engage with a nurse, someone at, at a front desk, or, and you might just slip. Hey, I'm visiting such and such brother or sister that's part of my church family. I mean, you're, you are making a, a decision to insert church family. I mean, you're trying to lead them to water, maybe. You never know what's going to happen. How about when people just see you maybe assisting a fellow brother or sister in Christ that needs help with their yard work? You never know what maybe conversations that can happen in that type of situation. Or handing out Bibles, gospel tracts. But I would encourage you, take some time to think about, meditate on what areas could I work on in my community. Encourage and share with one another some ideas. I personally know uh, of some individuals that work with other Christians. I know that doesn't actually probably happen a whole lot, sadly. But there's some great benefit there. You can encourage one another in your walk because you get to see each other a lot more. But those are, again, only a few examples. But make your own list and share it among you. Again, provoke, stir one another up into good works. See how you can serve the Lord throughout the week. We just, above all, we just need to find a way to communicate with the world that we are fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, and we want others to be part of that family as well. Back in January of 2022, I had a privilege of speaking with a fellow preacher uh, by the name of Warren King, you may be familiar with uh, Warren. He preaches in Arkansas. But our focus was, we had a biblical discussion on two words. Two words that I've stated a number of times throughout this message. And two words that we should pay very close attention to when we're reading the scripture and that's one another. And would you believe that one another is found in the New Testament more than 50 times? I would say that's pretty important. And this is in reference of when we had this discussion when we were talking about one another, it was not only how we are, but how we are not 
to relate to one another, what our relationship was supposed to look like. And if you wanted to say that there was an umbrella for this discussion, that what you find under all of this, the key theme is love. When you boil down, boil down to it. And I just want to provide just a, a, a brief list of some one another's that is stated in scripture that we should be aware of. We are to accept one another. Admonish. Bear another one's burdens. Care for one another. Comfort. Confess our faults. Be devoted. Consider one another better than ourselves. That's certainly contrary to the world. Edify, encourage, fellowship, forgive, honor, show hospitality, be kindly affectionate, like-minded, live in harmony, minister, be patient. I've already said provoke or stir up. We are also to salute or greet one another, serve one another, speak the truth, teach. We are not to devour one another. We are not to hate one another or not to grumble or complain, not to lie. And we certainly are not to speak ill of one another. And those are just a few, but hopefully that you get to the overall point. And that the word is abundantly clear and spoken of how we are to interact with one another. And above all, the love is at the bedrock of those characteristics characteristics which we are all to possess. A new commandment I give to you that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. When our Lord and Master uttered those words, the disciples didn't fully grasp what he was talking about. They didn't fully get his, its meaning. I mean, they did not believe what was soon to take place. They couldn't fathom, nor did they believe that he was going to be betrayed, that he was going to be arrested, that he was going to be mocked, scourged, and then die. And even when the Lord rose from the dead, they struggled with their belief. Yet over time, they came to understand and that their actions would prove that they were true disciples of the one and true living God and Savior, Jesus Christ. They would prove their faith. And they, were, they would prove their faith by having love for one another. God has blessed us with his word. And because of this precious gift, we can, without a doubt, we can know, we can show, and definitely we can grow in our love for one another. So let us to be determined this day to walk hand in hand with one another. I pray that we've been challenged in some form or fashion in this message. Because I know that I have been challenged. 
because I know that there are areas I need to grow in. And there are many aspects to the kingdom of God, and we just can't overlook our love for one another. So let us stir each other up into love and good works, because it is for his glory. We're going to be singing, I believe it's you coming to Jesus tonight. And this is a time to think about where you are at with your relationship with God and your relationship with your fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. Sometimes we can be hesitant and reluctant to share our burdens. Let's not do that. We are here to help. So if you need prayers, if you need encouragement, if you need to know what it means to walk hand in hand with the Lord, if you need to know what it means to walk hand in hand with one another, please don't leave this place this afternoon, this evening, without asking somebody. Please, I'll be happy to talk with you. I'm happy to pray with you. If you have sin that is keeping you separated from having that right relationship with God and others, please don't hesitate. Don't leave. We need to make things right because we're not, we're not promised a second in this life. So before you leave those doors, make sure your relationship is right with the one that can save it. So again, we're going to be singing, Are You Coming to Jesus Tonight? So take this time to consider where your relationship is at with the Lord. And please, don't hesitate to come forward if you have a need as we stand and sing.